This theory holds that the species on Earth were not created by God, but came into being as a result of processes governed entirely by chance. The founder of this theory was an amateur naturalist named Charles Darwin. Darwin expounded this theory in his book, The Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. Darwin's book was an instant success, but his popularity was due more to the ideological implications of the book rather than its scientific worth. Darwin's ideas provided considerable support for the materialistic philosophy which denied the existence of God. The founder of dialectical materialism, Karl Marx, dedicated his book Das Kapital to Darwin and wrote on the cover to Charles Darwin from a devoted admirer. Darwin's theory argued that all species descended from a common ancestor by means of little cumulative changes in long periods of time. Darwin could advance no sound evidence to prove this claim. Indeed, he was himself aware of the great many facts that invalidated his theory. He admitted these in his book in a chapter entitled, Difficulties on Theory. Darwin's hope was that these difficulties would be overcome by new scientific discoveries. But in fact, advances in science would refute Darwin's claims one by one. successively from a common ancestor. But how did that first living thing come into being? Darwin did not address this question at all in his book. He was not even aware that this point was one of the biggest refutations of his theory. The primitive understanding of science in his day assumed that life had a very simple structure. According to a theory called spontaneous generation, which was popular since the medieval age, it was believed that living things could easily arise from non-living matter. It was commonly thought that frogs spontaneously arose from mud and bugs from food leftovers. And some curious experiments were designed to prove these theories. A handful of wheat was left on a rag and mice were expected to arise from the mixture. The maggots on meat were also taken as evidence that life could generate from non-living matter. But later it was understood that such maggots did not form spontaneously, but that they emerged from microscopic larvae deposited on the meat by flies. And in Darwin's time, the belief that microbes could emanate easily from non-living materials was very common. after the publication of The Origin of Species, the famous French biologist Louis Pasteur scientifically refuted these myths that laid ground for evolution. After lengthy studies and several experiments, the famous French biologist Louis Pasteur refuted the foundation that lays ground for the theory of evolution. Can matter organize itself? No. Today, there is no circumstance known under which one could affirm that microscopic beings have come into the world without parents resembling themselves. The first evolutionist to take up the issue of the origin of life in the 20th century was the Russian biologist Alexander Oparin. His aim was to explain how the first living cell, the alleged common ancestor of all living beings according to the theory of evolution, could emerge. In the 1930s, Oparin formulated a number of theories to show how the first living cell could arise from inanimate matter by chance. However, his efforts ended in failure, and Oparin himself had to confess. Unfortunately, the origin of the cell remains a question that is actually the murkiest aspect of the whole theory of evolution. Evolutionists that followed Oparin 
conducted experiments to find an evolutionist explanation to the origin of life. The most famous of these experiments was conducted by the American chemist Stanley Miller in 1953. Miller obtained a few simple organic molecules by triggering a reaction among gases that he claimed would have been present in the primitive Earth atmosphere. At the time, this experiment was regarded as a scientific proof for evolution. It turned out to be no such thing at all. Later discoveries showed that the gases used in the experiment were very different from the gases that had been present in the early atmosphere of the world. Miller himself eventually admitted to the invalidity of his experiment. evolutionist attempt in the 20th century to account for the origin of life has ended in failure. Jeffrey Beta, a professor of geochemistry and a leading advocate of the theory of evolution, confesses this fact in the February 1998 issue of Earth. Today, as we leave the 20th century, we still face the biggest problem that we had when we entered the 20th century. How did life originate on Earth? The biggest impasse confronting evolution is the incredibly complex structure of the living cell. Every living thing on Earth is made up of cells about a hundredth of a millimeter in size. Some living things are made up of a single cell. Yet even these single cell organisms are remarkably complex in their composition. functions to survive, and even little motors to move. In Darwin's time, this complex structure of the cell was unknown. With the primitive microscopes of those days, cells appeared to be little more than featureless stains. However, powerful electron microscopes invented around the middle of the 20th century began revealing just how complex and organized a living cell really was. They laid bare a complexity and organization that could not be a product of chance. A living cell is comprised of thousands of tiny parts that work in harmony. To make a comparison, within the cell, there are power stations, high-tech factories, a complex data bank, huge storage systems, advanced refineries, and a seemingly conscious cell membrane that controls what enters and leaves the cell. In order for the cell to survive, all of these organelles have to exist at the same time. It is impossible that such an intricate and complex system could have emerged as a result of coincidences. So there's a big question if you're just kind of trying to assess how likely is it that we'd find a protein by chance with all the amino acids in that prebiotic soup interacting with each other for, say, billions of years? And I give it a lot of time. How likely is it that we'd ever get a protein to arise by chance? So I have a colleague who's been interested in the whole question of whether or not life could arise by chance for a long time. His name is Doug Axe. He's a molecular biologist. He did his PhD at Caltech. He worked for 14 years at Cambridge University and he wanted to find out how common or how rare are the functional sequences of amino acids among the big space of all the possible amino acids there are. And he came up with a really amazing number. And it's, it's 10 to the 74 power. So just to get the amino acid sequence properly, you've got it at odds of about 1 in 10 to the 74. But there's other probabilistic hurdles that have to be overcome. If you want to build a protein, we, learn, we know from chemistry that you have to attach the amino acids together with what's called a peptide bond. In nature, peptide bonds occur with about a one in two, you know, one in two frequency. Uh, half the bonds that form between amino acids are peptide bonds, half aren't. But if you get any bonds forming that aren't peptide bonds, you can't form a protein. So to form a protein 150 amino acids long, you've got a one in two chance at each site of getting the correct type of linkage. So you got one and two times one and two times one and two times one and two to the white power. 
I know, close to 150. Since we got linkages, we have 149, but call it 150, okay? So in other words, we got another huge exponential problem to overcome. So, and it turns out that one in two to the 150 is equal, is the same number as 10 to the 45th, one in 10 to the 45. So now we got two incredibly improbable things that we've got to overcome to build a functional protein by chance alone. One more problem. When you're building proteins, amino acids come in two flavors. There's a left-handed flavor and a right-handed flavor. They're called optical isomers, not flavors, okay? And the left-handed version is the only kind that can be used in building proteins. You get even one right-handed amino acid in there and your protein won't fold properly. So you got another probabilistic hurdle to overcome. So you've got a one in two chance at each side again, out to the 150th power. Two to the 150th power, again, is 10 to the 45. Oh my goodness. So the odds of building even a short functional protein by chance alone is 74 plus 20. You can remember how you do this in math. You can add the exponents if you're multiplying exponential numbers. Thank you very much. Okay? Wow. Now, can anyone get their mind around a number that big? There's only 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the entire universe. There's only 10 to the 16th seconds since the, the Big Bang. There's only 10 to the 139th total events since the, the beginning of the universe. Now, now you're starting to get the uh, understanding of why people are very skeptical that the chance hypothesis is, is going to do the job. Now, you may have heard just the opposite. Has anyone ever gotten in a discussion with you about the origin of life and said, hey, it happened by chance? And do you hear that? I mean, uh, this happens to me. I'm out and I'll be lecturing in hostile university environments, and I'll, I'll get done in some they say, well, but, but, they want to argue with me about the probabilities. And, and I just shut the discussion down because they say, no serious scientist thinks this is the way it happened. No serious scientist thinks this is the way it happened. No serious scientist thinks this is the way it happened. Modern biochemistry has also revealed the unimaginably complex design of the DNA molecule.